Good evening. Sorry to cut your, your shot. I feel like you was just getting into it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. How are we feeling? Feeling good, feeling good. Hi, my name is Dr. Alima Gray, and I am the lead curator for Beyond the Baseline, 500 Years of Black British Music. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's a real pleasure to be here tonight, this evening. This evening is a very special event for me, but I'll just talk a little bit about Beyond the Baseline, the work that we're doing. For those of you who haven't seen the exhibition, it's open until the 26th of August. The exhibition is a partnership project between uh, the University of Westminster, uh, the Black Music Research Unit, headed up by Dr. Michael Riley, who's just standing over there videoing. Um, and it's all about black British music heritage. We kind of trace the trajectory 500 years. So we begin in the ocean and we end up in cyberspace. So we're thinking about the responsibility that this, these institutions, heritage institutions, have in documenting, preserving, and caring for our stories. And also thinking about the ways in which African and Caribbean musicians in Britain have kind of transformed the landscape of popular culture, popular British culture. And this evening is a particularly exciting one for me, because I feel like Garage, I was saying earlier, is kind of my generation. Generation. <laughs> and also one of the things sadly that you know we wish we could have expanded upon a little bit more in the exhibition is garage so no better uh, thing to do in the events program which is really a core part of beyond the baseline than to actually spotlight you know garage music 30 years celebrating 30 years of garage music yes we have to give that a round of applause But I would like to give a special, special, special thanks to Ray Paul uh, from the Play uh, Maker Group, who has been supporting the events. Um, bringing together those who are the visionaries, the pioneers, and this event is a particularly special one. And so, I, I mean, I'm not going to keep on talking. I'm going to hand it over to the reason why we're all here, uh, which is really to, to kind of celebrate, celebrate the legacy, spotlight the legacy with those who are at the heart of garage music. And no better person to hand this mic over to than Bushkin, uh, one of the founders, Bush, one of the founders of Heartless Crew. Um, so Everybody, please welcome uh, Bush to the stage. Thank you. My gosh, yes. Good early evening, everybody. Thank you for coming down. Welcome to the British Library presents Beyond the Baseline. 500 years of black British music. Yes, yes, um, I'm your host MC Bushkin, I've got an amazing all-star panel with me, um, but before I introduce, introduce them, I just want to, uh, it's kind of overwhelming being here, like um, in this prestigious venue, so yeah, I just want to say I'm really grateful, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for having us, um, it's an amazing event. Uh, I got a chance to see the exhibition earlier. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, I got a chance to see the, ex um, the exhibition earlier. It's amazing, you all definitely need to check it out. I'm definitely gonna say, you didn't, you, you said earlier there was a little bit of garage, there was absolutely no garage in there at all, <laughs> at all. I'm gonna throw you under the bus, but it's still amazing. <laughs> so yeah, you need to check it out. Um, Got to do a big shout out to my brother Fonty as well, playing the background music, absolutely smashing it, absolutely smashing it. Um, and on that note then, I think I can introduce my panelists. First, I'm going to invite onto the stage the Queen, the Queen of UKG. Please make some noise for Kelly Luwak. One, two, 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 one, two,
right, sign in one, two, one, two. Are we switched on? Oh, I'm on, I can hear myself. Hello, <laughs> yep, one, two, yep, I'm there now. <laughs> yes, Kelly, big up, thanking you Thank for joining you. us. Kelly Lewak, if you don't know, like I said, the queen of UKG. Oh, can I just say, one of the queens, there are a few of us. <laughs> okay, oh, we love that humbleness. Um, you cannot go to a garage rave without hearing a couple of Kelly Lewak tunes. Um, not just a garage artist, you do all sorts of music. Recently under the tune with that what, one big tune. Um, starred recently in, your, in a series, a reality show. There's no housewives in South London. You need to check that out. Check it out. Um, <laughs> it's very funny. Very, very good. You even bang me in on a little cameo. I did. And cussed me out, but we won't go there. <laughs> um, and recently you set up your own clothing line as well. So, yeah, please, one more time. Make some noise Thanks. for Kelly Rock. Next, I want to introduce, all the way from Manchester, Zed Bias onto the stage. Producer, DJ Extraordinaire. Yes. Yes, Zed, big up, big up. Bad man producer, gonna come as bad as man DJ, can. got a string of hits. Um, we're going to get into it, got a string of hits under his belt and also just celebrated 25 years of Zed Bias. Again, make some noise for Zed, please. One of his big hits there. And last but certainly not least, please make some noise for DJ Spoonie. Yes. Spoonie. One of the members of the infamous Dream Team. Um, I'm going to step out here, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite positive you were the first kind of group to have a garage show on Radio One. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, you've got some amazing production under the belt, um, and then recently gone on to set up the big garage weekend in Butlins. Hey. Amazing. Amazing, as she knows. We performed there twice, absolutely amazing. And also the um, Garage Orchestra, which is doing Big. Garage Classical. Garage Classical. So, yeah, please, one more time for Spoonie. Right. Hey, yo, if, you don't, if you don't mind, I'm just going to play a little background music. Um, I'll try not to get too carried away and turn it into a party. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, I've got two decks in front of me, so I'll try. <laughs> Of course. Okay, um, the picture in the background. Just a little bit about myself. Got a little slide here. The picture in the background. This is me way back in the days. Um, was last week. <laughs> <laughs> this is way back in the days. This is um, in Hornsey. I grew up in North London. In my house, was, it was always music, rare groove, reggae, lovers rock, soul. Um, so, yeah. I grew up, my mum was in the sound system, and my older brother, and I wanted to follow in their footsteps um, and create a sound system. This is me in secondary school, where the idea is kind of <laughs> cemented now. Um, around this time, I've met DJ Fonty and another friend of mine, David Ogwan, and yes, we set up a, a youth sound system, or a youth sound system, um, playing in our local youth club, um, community halls, and stuff like that. Quickly moving on. This is a jungle tape. Um, some people are going to be familiar with these TDK 90s. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, one of my favourites ever. Like this is DJ Russia, Funky Flirt, and MC Shabba D, which was a big inspiration for me. Big up MC Shabba. Um, we wanted to be jungle DJs ourselves. Didn't quite happen, but we was raving jungle religiously. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah>. this, <laughs> Come on. Yes, th this is me and my cousin in the early jungle days with our off-key pattern machino, <laughs> um, living our best lives. <coughs> One, two. I um, don't know which mic's better. But anyway, um, so yeah, that was uh, us raving in the jungle days. This is a flyer. It's hard to read, but this is like Bushkin promotion. This is like 1995. 1st of July, 1995. This is like um, early Heartless Crew race. Um, if you notice at the bottom, music playing the music. It's that soul swing, jungle. Two pound. And <laughs> <bagger. laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Two pound before 10, free after. Three pound after. Three pound after. Good old, we, we've always been for the people. The good old um, 
Two babies. And this is another one. Um, this is like people kind of like North and East London would remember like Clisso Park. That was like an all dayer. So we put on our little Clisso Park after party kind of. Um, and then for the real jungle ravers who remember an event called Voodoo Magic. And that used to start, I think, like something crazy, like 3 a.m. in the morning. So this was our party, and it was like the Voodoo Magic warm up. I don't know if you can read this at the bottom there. It says designed and printed by DJ Funny. <laughs> Get your flowers, buddy. You have to. I'll tell you a quick story. Like, we, uh, we obviously went to the same secondary school. We said, Design these flies. That is like an X Men card. I don't know if you remember those X Men cards, like Marvel cards. So that's Professor X. The last one was Storm. We used to kind of scan them in in the um, IT. Fonte was really good at IT as well. I've got to give him his flowers. He was good at everything in school, literally. Um, and then we used to like print the flies and then cut them up on the school guillotine and then go around. <laughs> In the library, in fact. Yeah. We used to do it in the library. In the, desk, right, <laughs> in, in the library. And then go around, hand them out at Camden Girls School and various other schools. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then this is like us in the early, early, like, garage days, in the jungle days, kind of holding our skills. Um, this is like Wednesday Club, uh, Club Phoenix in Finsbury Park. Um, this is like a... <laughs> Yes, yeah, you sort of remember like this phone here was a classic. Um, the, the, Ericsson, the, the Ericsson days, a uh, load of numbers were in that phone, but we won't go there. Um, and then that brings us on to, this is like college days now, like this is that Heartless Crew, as most people know it, um, in our fashion, uh, pattern Moschino. Um, I think that picture is kind of like 1998. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's a kind of, there's another version of it which is kind of iconic. And um, yeah, man, that was us on our journey as a Heartless crew, and the rest, as they say, is history. So, enough about me. I just want to give you a little bit of backstory. Um, our, our wonderful panelists. <laughs> We're here to talk about garage. It's just an open conversation. And Spoonie, I want to kick it off with you. Um, Tell us about your early DJ career, because like us, I know you didn't start playing garage music, so just tell us about this, just your, your early DJ vibes. Um, is my mic working? Can you hear me? Yeah, it's working fine. Thank you. Um, so, I, I first started DJ, I was about 15. Um, <laughs> it's always me. <laughs> okay, we're good. Yeah, check. Mic check. All right. But yeah, I was, I was about 15 playing soul, really, when I first started. Um, about 1987, 88, I discovered house music. And then house music kind of fractured a little bit more. Um, and I went to the soulful side of house. Um, they had like happy hardcore and more tech, where I think the groove came out of the music. And then I went the soulful way, and then that developed into Garage. I was, I was working, nine, 1995, I was still working full-time, and by 1997, I'd gone full-time, like, professional uh, DJ. It happened, it hap I say it happened quickly, it didn't, because I've been doing it since I was 15. Um, but I'm just an all-round music lover, really. Yeah. yeah, love that, love that. So, tell us then, what was your first, like, experience of, of Garage music? Um, so I was, I used to be on a pirate radio station called London Underground, and when I first started, um, I've still got some of the cassettes, I didn't use D90s because they were a bit cheap, so I went... Uh, <laughs> I went for the SAs, the metal Shots SAs, I'm joking. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm a, remember, I'm a little bit older, so I wasn't just relying on pocket money, so... Um, <laughs> oh, God, I'm going, no, I'm going. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute, yeah. when, let, let, let's just, that, that's not shade. Let me tell you, when, <laughs> when, when he is talking about when he's doing those club events, you guys are still at school, or, or, or college, you're young. You haven't got endless funds, so you use what you can. We yeah. all did it, we all, we're all were there. I'm at least 10 years older than him, so I can say that. No Thank way. you. <laughs> no. <laughs> huh? 10 years? At least. You definitely look good. I second that. <laughs> Wow. At least 10 years? <laughs> bang on. Uh, bang on 10 years. Right, okay. So, 
Um, I lost my train of thought there. That's Pocket what happens money. when you chat rubbish when you get Pocket to the stage. Um, so yeah, um, so I'm making these tapes, and then I've then gone. I've absolutely lost my train of thought. I wasn't talking about pocket money there. Okay, I was saying your first experience. Of garage music, oh. that's it. So I joined London Underground and I was playing more kind of soulful, soulful house and vocal house. And then at that time, the UK DJs and producers started making a sound for here, as opposed to us playing the US records in our way. So then it had its own sound. And then my show started being a little bit of American production, a little bit of UK production, hooked up with Timmy and Mikey, and then, and then you know, the rest, it just yeah, went. Yeah, that was a little salute, the dream team. So, Zed, um, similar kind of thing with you. Uh, like, when did you first get into garage music? Garage music, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Loud and clear. Right, so, I suppose a few years before that, I got into making music as a bit of a bedroom producer. Okay. Um, I wrote a list of jobs that I could do that didn't have a boss, and that was the one that I preferred doing. <laughs> I, like that, yeah. I did that, and my previous job to that, I was security in the, the biggest nightclub in the UK at the time, The Sanctuary. Wow, okay. So, yeah. 94 to 96, I was there searching people, and <laughs> like uh, Jungle Fever, Dreamscape, could you Helter have Skelter. Could you have it? Uh, uh, it looks like he still can. I <laughs> the money, do you know what I mean? My six pound an hour, or whatever it was in 94. Yeah. See? Trust me, six money. pound an hour. Yeah. But anyway, um, I, I learned what a baseline was, walking in and out of the, the different arenas, and it was more jungle then. Yeah. But then I sort of learned how to... I got an Akai sampler, learned how to use it. I got employed by um, Lambert, who you would know, right? Sidewinder. Yeah, yeah, Sidewinder. Yeah. So he had a studio in the bottom of his cellar, and I used to engineer, because I, I knew my way around an Akai and uh, an Atari Cubase. So I engineered for Breeze, for Dougal, a couple. Um, um, it was like happy hardcore guys, uh, vibes. You know, all these old guys that I'd, I'd probably search at the sanctuary guy then. Um, but then I got to know the guys, like Principal, Lambert, Juice Man. Yep. And I started sidewinding with these guys. OK. Yeah. Seems he's a... Founding member. What? Yeah. Original. You didn't know that, did you? I didn't know that. Bruv, We're you... here to learn. This is, this is wonderful. But you don't, do, you don't have it anymore, do you? No, I, 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 call, I was telling you this. I called a meeting. Because I do um, them all the time. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, tr <laughs> trust me, I, ca I called the meeting and I disbanded it. I'm like, there was a few things happening. I was getting a few phone calls <laughs> that was confusing me because I'm the, the, the label side, I'm the back of house, and I'm getting calls like, why aren't I being paid for playing at the Sanctuary <laughs> or, or wherever, you know what I mean? Yeah. That might have been Bushkin. So, so, <laughs> oh, so I was getting disgruntled <laughs> MCs, disgruntled DJs calling me and I was just getting annoyed. So I, I said, look, why don't we, you know, I take the label. Yeah. You you take that. Wave. I made five pound, he made like millions, I'm telling you like, tens of thousands of tape packs. <laughs> and I'm not mad, do you know what I mean? Everyone has to start somewhere, oh, innit? Yeah, you know yeah. I, mean? I was literally just gonna ask you that and it wasn't, obviously I didn't even know this information, but Sidewinder is that like, doing major things now, ain't you like? I've, I, I'm not, I'm doing my thing. Everyone's got their own journey, innit? Yeah. You know, I'm not gonna, start hating now, yeah. 25 years later. No, it's just a pleasure to have been part of the start. You know of history, mean? yeah. And Sidewinder Records, we had like five, six releases and that led on to Neighbourhood getting signed and, you know, it's all right. It's all part of the puzzle, isn't can, it? Can I just jump in there quickly, Please. right? Because he is so humble. He, w he won't say it, but I think as a DJ and someone who has kind of made his career playing and using other people's talents to the best of his ability. He is one of UK Garage's best and greatest producers. He is one of our most talented. He should be... Yes. Right. Bless you. And he's... he's he, he, when, we, when we talk, and, and I suppose we're all guilty of it to a degree, but when we talk about the best songs and the best producers, his name does not get put into that bracket enough, and it should be, because he's brilliant. So even though he's just saying there humbly... Yeah, the name you know, the just slipped it in. Yeah. He just slipped it in. Like, he's, he's, he's phenomenal. And I, I will put him up next to most of them to go, all right, then come out of that genre and give me something else. 
This is a don that we list. I, I read list. somewhere once that you're only as good as your last record. So I'm always preoccupied about what I'm writing next. next. Yeah. And I'm 25 years deep, a bit as deep as Zed Bias, 30 years using equipment, and I'm still trying to make my next record yeah. bigger. You know, so yeah. I'm not... Not looking at what I've done. Yeah, yeah. No, I, mean, I love that's, that. That's, that's back there. I, I love that. And you know what, Smith? I was actually going to come to because the, one of the tunes you produced, um, Your Mind, the remix, yeah. is actually one of my favourite garage tunes of all I've time. Got, I've got a little rejiggle for you. I'm, Let them wait DMs a week, later. can it? Let me have it first. Okay. Now. You've got it. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, 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 okay. The smooth operator. All right, you can hold it now. You yeah. can hold it now. Font, you can get it now. Font, you can get it now. It's really worth the break. It's worth the break. He's had enough wear out. <laughs> yes, really. Oh, yes, you might. Oh, yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah. This is yeah. the one. I forgot you even done this. You might. I've too many. Yes, you I've heard this for a little bit, you know. We used to pepper this tune, you know. You that's, might. That's the darker mix, isn't it? You might. Yeah. Yes, you might. Yes, you might. Yeah, just hear the bass sound quickly. Bad, bad. Yeah, let me watch you watch it. Yeah. Oh, oh. Hey, that's our big reggae bass line there, you know. Z <laughs> bias. Hey. Mix it up. Whoa. Whoa. Instinctive that, you know. Yeah. Big Z bias. Yes. Yes, Z bias, man. Big up. So can I can I just say like I made maybe 10 what I'd call like mini anthems or whatever. Everybody was cutting them on plate. Uh, everyone was, you know, interested and I was being phoned down for them. And at least five of them come out on DFL, right? Like, the, we were early Spoonie, doctors. Mikey B, Timmy, like, they put me on. They, I remember one time um, when it wasn't Coco, it was uh, Camden Cam Palace. Palace. And uh, you actually told me, I was there with Andy Lewis, and you actually told me, you called me over to your table, sitting there holding court. <laughs> right. That sounds you, nothing like you, me. Bro, you, you told me I was going in the charts next week. Yeah, you, you would have, you told me. So, fair play. Rub Did my you, hands on my you, head. I wish you'd tell me that. You knew, you knew huh? what was going on. I wish you'd tell me that I'm going in the charts. Yeah. <laughs> Still can't. Wait, it was true. I can't make any more, <laughs> I can't make any more jokes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, um, I've got to mention also, we are streaming live. A few people couldn't make it down in Living Colour, so we're actually streaming live on Cast Room. Big up the Cast Room crew. I'm sure they can ask this is the guys. The live, they can, um, they're going to be putting up some questions. And Yes, Leon, big up, Irish. Yes, guys. Yes, yes. There's a little bit of a delay, just in case we swear, they don't have to hear it, so there you go. <laughs> nice. Yes. Okay, the wonderful Kelly Lee Rock, sitting down just quietly looking amazing. Looking amazing. Um, yeah, man, tell us about your experiences. How did you get into Garage Music? I know you had some R&B hits under your belt. And, I did, um, I did. And actually... The first time I heard a garage song, I hated it. <laughs> I did, I did. Get so off my stage. Hold on. I... Get out of it. When I left school, um, there was a guy that I went to school with called Adam Shea, and he used to work on a stall in front of my granddad's shop. And um, I remember, I used to see him because I used to go see my granddad all the time. So maybe it was like a Saturday, and we just left school, so maybe it was like 16, 17. And he was like, oh, have you heard that music, Garage? And I was like, <laughs> no, let me hear it. So he played me MK's remix, Freaking You, which is Jodeci. Now, 16-year-old Kelly was not having that because I loved Jodeci. I was like, this is disgusting. <laughs> I was like, what is this sacrilege? <laughs> I, was just, I was so annoyed about it. But ironically, that's now one of my favorite garage like remixes. It's such a great remix that MK did. But um, I just kept hearing about it, hearing about it, hearing about it. And then I think my first like, visit to a proper garage club, I went to Gas Club. Okay, we'll send, yes. And I walked in, and Norris was there, and Creed, and they both had locks. I thought they were twins. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, they still look like twins, didn't they, back in the day? Good fathers of garage. Yeah, and then when I properly got into it is when I went to Twice As Nice, which was, yes. I went to the first ever Twice As Nice. Um, uh, it was Coliseum, Coliseum. Yeah. And um, I just loved, I loved the, like, the lollipop, 
off the horns. Like it was just, it was an experience. Yeah. And that's when I fell in love with garage music. And also what I liked about it is that you could invite your friends that didn't like garage because there was another room and they could go listen to R&B oh, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and you could go listen to a bit of R&B as well. So that's when I fell in love with garage. And that, and that, and how I kind of started doing garage music is I was like, I want to hear my song played in this club. I bet you heard many. Mm. We all did like. Your voice was all over that. Oh, scene. thank you. Yeah. Uh, but at the time, no. At the time, no. I, I was, it was ironic because I was in the charts and I wanted to be in the club. Mm. Yeah, normally, it's the other way around. You're in the club and you want to be in the charts. And I was like, I want to hear my song in this club. Yes. Okay. You know what? Um, you mentioned Coliseum, which is like an iconic garage event. Um, like, Try and paint a picture for us of a typical Coliseum night, a Sunday, how people look, the drinks, the glasses. Can you paint that picture? Yeah. You were there. I was there. No, I want to hear, hear from you. Well, one thing I will say, people did dress up. Yeah. Like, I remember wearing heels. I, even now, like, as a performer, I do not like wearing heels on stage. Like, if I can get away with wearing a flat or a sandal, I would do that. But we used to wear heels. People used to dress up and, you know, you know, the, the, the guys used to dress up. They were a bit mismatched, but they would dress up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they would have on all their mismatched machino and stuff. But you know what's really mad, yeah? This sounds really bizarre, yeah, but... As you were walking through Coliseum, like, if you was going to the bathroom or you was going to the R&B room, there was a corner, yeah? And there'd be all these guys with dark glasses on in their mismatched machino smoking crack. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, Hold on. Hold on. I meant I was going to say Hold on. No. <laughs> Was I wasn't so expecting that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's so bad. The first thing that comes to mind, that's why I pulled the face. It's the smell as you walk It's the smell. So I was at a festival <laughs> maybe last year or two years ago, and someone was smoking crack. And someone was like, what is that smell? And I was like, oh my God, it's Coliseum. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, then. I mean, I suppose, I suppose this is a good time to tell everybody uh, Kelly LaRock doesn't actually have a filter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just big I'm big, very big. real, yeah. Wow, well, wow. Well. Uh, um, all right, Kelly, looking over the... <laughs> looking over the last 30 years, did you ever think we'd be here now? No. Especially as, like I said, I just wanted to be part of the scene. I remember I flew in from Napa. I, I, I begged my label, they said yes, I think because they heard that it was like the new thing. So they kind of co-signed it. And I flew in from Napa, I went to studio um, and I recorded. So actually prior to that, I did do a little bit of loving, which I did with um, Banana Republic, which was Carl Tough Enough Brown and who was Gavin. the guy? Gavin. Gavin Mills. Gavin Mills. Uh, but then that was, they, they did that four to the floor, which ironically I love more than Two Step. But Two Step was just being birthed. So it didn't really do that much, but then I did um, My Love with Tim Below, which is Tim Deluxe and Omar, and I flew in from Napa, I remember being tired, and we were just having a vibe. Like, we weren't trying to make an anthem, we weren't trying to, like, make a song that stood the test of time. I was just like, let's make a garage record, and they'll play it in the club, and then I can say, this is my sound, like, yeah. <laughs> in Coliseum. Do you know what I mean? Maybe I'll do a couple of PAs, but yeah, that was really, that was all I wanted, like, and like, 30 years later, I'm still singing it. It's, real, it's mad. So you actually, you actually just spoke it and manifested it. Just like ma that. You know when you're doing the secret and you don't even know you're doing the secret? Yeah. I was doing the secret. Wow. Thanks. <laughs> um, I mean, go on, is that my love? Let's give him a little. I got it all here, mate. Anything you're saying, I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, boy. You see, the. the A long crew in the crowd. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> wow. So, wow, a, wow. a little, um, the, the, the precursor to Twice as Nice at the Coliseum was a, an event on a Sunday called The Arches. And that was sort of like in between London Bridge and Tower Bridge, just one of the arches, called Pleasure Playground. And uh, whatever happened, the, the, the license was gone. And then um, the two promoters, split. So one went and done Adrenaline Village, that was called Fit and Funky, and half the residents went, went there, which were uh, Carl Tough Enough Brown, Timmy and Mikey. They went and be resident there. And I went with the other promoter, with Matt Jan Lamont. Um, and that other event became 
twice as nice. So we, uh, you know, I was resident there from from the outset, and watching it all happen and watching it all grow, and you know, the rise and the fall and the rise again. And your tight leather pants. Huh? And I'm your tight leather pants. <laughs> 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 they Every tight leather pants. They weren't actually tight because they. <laughs> <laughs> because because they're leather, they look tight. <laughs> anyway, but um, yeah, twice twi twice as nice. I've I've been on record saying that I think. It was um, or is the jewel in the crown of UK Garage Clubbing because it was the time was pivotal. It was a time when everything was growing. It was, it was you know, the A listers from the genuine A listers yeah. from America would come in, not go out on a Saturday night, they'd go to Coliseum on a, on a Sunday. Everyone was there. And, and for me, it was like, I was just saying to, to Zed off air that having res getting respect is one thing, but having respect from your peers is like the greatest, right? And, and, and on any given Sunday, you would see all the other DJs and MCs from the scene in the club that weren't working. Just partying. They were just partying, and that's when you knew, it was that's happening. when you knew you were onto something, yeah. you know what I mean? And um, everyone else was in there, Jordan, uh, Jordan, I remember seeing Jordan in there, all the footballers. Everybody. Yeah. Everyone, yeah. everyone everybody, was like, at that place, Coliseum. David Beckham used to come. On a Sunday, yeah. Posh Rio Ferdinand was yeah. Girls, Rio Spice was Spice, yeah. them, Anyway, I'm not going to name drop too much, but that was, um, that yeah, time, yeah. remember they, they were young, so they, yeah. you wouldn't even be guaranteed to get in unless you, you know what I mean? No, but yeah, they were, those were... It's, it's interesting to say, literally at that particular time, like everyone wanted to get into the garage scene. Like, yeah, it was yeah. all about garage. Yeah, no matter where you went, up and down the country. You know what, um, talking about up and down the country, then garage went overseas to Iron Upper. Let's talk a bit about Iron Upper. In fact, before we go there, I have... <laughs> Let me just flip through quickly. Here we go. What? That's it. What? Hey! <laughs> oh, the archive Look at the sweet boys. Look at the sweet boys. A very boys. young Spoonie. Oh, with gosh. Our very own DJ Fonzie. That's, over 20, that's over 20 years, that. We mean, we, we mean young. That's only three weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. I mean, Yeah, geez. Let, let's talk about Iron Napa. Um, I'm going to flick through. I've got a few Iron Upper classics. Just stop that. So in the middle, I'll see the next one. From my archives. Wait, I'm going to go back here. Oopsie daisy. Yep, there's a one. Well, no, but hey, we won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> these guys, you want to yep. talk about these guys, Spoonie? Yeah, so those, those guys basically own Iron Upper between them. Um, the, guy, the guy on the right. For, uh, um, Linos. 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 He, he's part of a family that own all the main venues. Melas. The, the, yeah. the Melas. The guy in the middle. Tony, he was the, he managed the club. So the first club that ever held a big UK garage event uh, was called Pazaz, and he 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 ran the he ran the club. Yeah. Uh, Pure Silk did the first ever night. DJ S, MC Creed, and myself promoted it in I don't know like a week. We went out there. I mean, there's a funny story that goes with that, but we ain't got time. But that we have, we have, we have. <laughs> we have. I, I mean, I've, I've said it's funny. It's not really that funny. But S S. Uh, you, how can I kind of set the picture? We we were just none of us were businessmen. We were just people who loved the music and were just trying to ting. Is the best way to put it. I haven't got subtitles to explain what trying to ting means, but <laughs> it's just. Bluffing it is maybe a different way of saying it. So S, S called me, say, on a Thursday, and he said, right, what are you doing the following Friday? So I was like, uh, yeah, nothing. Um, he said, right, I might be doing an event abroad, but I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> so I'm thinking, abroad? Anyway, Friday come, didn't hear from S. Monday come, didn't hear from S. Tuesday, hey, are you still free on Friday? I said, bruv, you're not... You're not calling me to ask me about Friday on Tuesday. Yeah, 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 we're going. I want to book this. We're doing this event in Cyprus. Me, you and Creed, da 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 um, Three days later, we went out there. There's like six, 700 people at, uh, at Pizzazz. It went off. Um, they did one more. And then the next year, it was like... Everyone. It was just everywhere. So, yeah. you know, to these guys and DJ S, visionary, yeah. taking and that punk in, in we four need to days. mention Kerry, because Kerry, do you remember Kerry? He was behind. Yeah, Kerry. Kerry yeah. S and Alpesh. Yeah, that was right. The yeah, yeah. Line up. <laughs> yeah. Three amigos. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, right. I, 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 always rem I always remember the names because 
You always have to know who to chase for your money. Mm. And then, mm. then one of the banes of our job is chasing promoters for money. So I never forget. I never forget their names. And we're going to mention George on the boy. far left here as well. Like he was collecting the money. Remember he done yeah. all the doors and he had everything to a T. He would friend. collect the money, but the guy on the right was. The he one you had it. to get the money from. Yeah, he was, yeah. He was banking it. You could look in his eyes, you could tell that was a job. <laughs> <laughs> the next slide is also Ayanapa. It's um, one of our panellists. I'm not too sure what happened to him. Um, but there is a very young mega man in Ayanapa. <laughs> Mr. Soul Solid Crew himself. Um, their accolades are vast. They had a, a number one in the national charts in the UK with 21 seconds. Um, Mega Man's an entrepreneur. He got a lot of his peers, record deals, set up a um, radio station, done countless events, um, a clothing brand, and is still like, heavily involved in music, pulling strings behind the scenes. So, big up Mega Man. I'm not too sure what happened to him, but <laughs> definitely, definitely deserves his flowers. I think he came from the swimming pool there because he's got his goggles on. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> we won't go there. Um, the next one. <laughs> the next slide, Iron Up again. This is a very young Romeo and our very own DJ Fonte. Fonte, he's got his one night stand t shirt on. <laughs> Which was a club night, by the way. Machino, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. Uh, um, the next one. You guys will remember those. When you was in good favour with the clubs, um, those guys we saw in the other picture, uh, the Malas family, they owned also this club, Black and White, which was like the R&B club, and then they had these buggies. And if you was in good favour, they'd give you these buggies to drive around and promote your events. Um, and yeah, they loved us as hard as we was making them loads of money. But anyway, so that's me posing on the buggy, living my best life. This is me in Pizzazz Club doing the screechy dance. And the last one, this is me and a friend in Iron Upper. Um, she looks like you're more her friend than she's yours. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were just comparing string vests, if I can remember correctly. Um, and yeah, remember that top there around my neck? That's a Logo Moschino shirt. We're going to talk about that later. Um, and then this is Heartless Crew Club Ice Classic Iron Apple picture. We'll leave that there for a second. Guys, let's talk about Iron Apple. Some memories, some stories, some of the events. I had a madness. <laughs> I've, I've, I've been twice. I couldn't remember the second time. <laughs> <laughs> too, too drunk. That says it but all. The first time, I, I, I arrived in the daytime and I was due to play in Nissy Square uh, on the Radio 1 stage after Dave Pierce. So I did what everybody should do and I went out and got drunk, sat by the pool, got really sunburned. <laughs> like, really sunburned. I, I go like a swan vest of me. Like, you know, I, need, I, I need factor 100. So. I've made it to the thing, and um, I'm playing dub plates that I've cut a music house. Mm. Wookie's dad's so Big up music house the, uh, as well, yeah, man. Yeah. I can mention music house. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, Bag of Dubs, the last tune that um, Dave put on blew the system. And I'm doing like an ISD, ISDN mix live onto Radio 1. Right, and all I can hear is monitors, but really all I'm hearing is Boo! From about 20,000 people in Nissy Square. What and I'm there, right, and it looks like I'm going red, but I'm just sunburned. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, yeah, wow. forget, forget. I'm sure you've all had good times, but yeah, forget that part. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly. Talk to me about Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll come there, Kelly. I know you have had some epic. I was a Napa veteran, like literally, from the first time I went to Napa, I went every year for 13 years. Wow. I think I missed a couple years when the mayor banned garage. Garage, yes. But yeah, other than oh, that, wow. I was there every Steve. year. Yeah. Like even when I stopped getting booked, like when even when it went into funky, I still just went on holiday. Yeah. I was, it was like my second home. Yeah. I, I was, loved it. Literally gonna say, I remember being in Napa sometimes and you, you know, the queen of scene just walking around, going partying, <laughs> taking photos of everyone, just so normal, just loving the vibe, going out clubbing, shots. She's yeah. the people's queen, Kelly, you know. Do you know what? I would say that because 
After I did your spoonful of garage in Butlins, I got ill in it. And I was like, you know what it is? People, people just want to kiss me. Oh, this, I get kissed so much. For like, obvious reasons, I love Kelly. hugging. I'm very, like, welcoming and smiley and happy. So people always just want to hug me and kiss Have me. Have you not looked at yourself before? <laughs> yeah, what has that got to do with anything? That's why everyone wants to kiss you. No, but I'm just, like, maybe because I'm smiley. People just want to hug and kiss me all the time. But sometimes I'm like, I need, like, I get ill. Like, <laughs> I need to preserve my voice. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no. I, I, to be fair, you know, I, I, when people want to take a picture or come say, I'm always like, I, 30 years on, they still want to like know me. So I'm just blessed about that. Do you know, what it's, I mean? hum it's humbling, isn't it? It's you have aged. That's what it is, Kelly. After all this time, people can't believe it. They just have to touch you, make sure you. <laughs> Make, make sure I don't real. fall off. Make sure they don't clone you. You know they're doing clones nowadays. Make sure you just do the same Kelly they look like. Uh, but you know what? Speaking of Napa, can I tell you my lyric that I made about I Napa from the first time we went to Napa? You remember in the bush? Please, of course. British Library, let me tell you. First, I got off the plane at Larnaca. I got a cab straight to Ayanapa. Reach a club named Insomnia. I went straight to the bar, bought a Zambuka. I was TikTok tipsy but still lively. TikTok tipsy but still ivory. I can soon do the skip scan and screechy, and I can soon write my moped home safely. Then a girl asked me, What do I drink, Fanti? I'll have a lemonade and a cherry brandy. She don't know me, but she'll buy a drink for me because she wants to be drunk to take advantage of me. What? She see me tipsy. <laughs> now, become a tipsy, then I tell you can lips me. You're too licky, licky, girl. Let's just take the mickey on. They want to take the cookie. Hey. Yes. They were, they, they, they were genuinely great days. That, I mean, I'd say the golden period. I'm going to be a little bit biased, but from sorry, didn't use your name. No, but from uh, 1998 to 2002, 2003, yeah. before. It, re it, it was discovered, but before it was really discovered by the mass, like we could go out there, I mean... It was I'd, at home, wasn't it? Sometimes I'd be there like twice in a week. Yeah. You fly out and do your gig yeah. and then come home, do the weekend and then go back Monday morning. There was a 10 o'clock flight, Cypress Airways, Terminal 1, Heathrow. You know, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So yes. Just, like, Ibiza's the spiritual like, home of house. Was, yeah, was yeah. No, 100%. It was the home of garage. 100%. 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100 and it, 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 it was such a... When I think back to the times of where, like, travelling now is a complete different experience, that we were able to pull up Right outside the terminal, yep. walk right across, in. literally just walk across the road, like from less distance from here to the back of the auditorium. In the check in, people knew you because you were just there last week. <laughs> no long thing, yeah. two record boxes, you didn't have to put 100 milligram on nothing, two in. 50 kilograms of records on the plane. Bam. <laughs> Beautiful times, man. <laughs> um, you was broadcasting as well for Radio One from Iron Appa. Um, tell us about that, because I know that must have been crazy. That was that was that was bonkers time. 2001, the summer. So we we joined Radio One in 2000, um, which was a bit of a departure for them as a station. All three of us on a Sunday morning from 10 till one. But we um, that summer we started saying that we're going to be out there. Mm. Everyone's going to be out there. Garage music was huge, absolutely everywhere in the charts. So there was no reason for them not to come. Um, so they, they had this bay, Macronisos Beach, set up a big stage and we turned up and if you can imagine people on the beach and in the sea, now it wouldn't even pass health and safety. Mm. Like, they were, they, they were on the beach, we were on the stage, we had the full mystique, Alicia, Sabrina um, and Sue Elise, Wookie and Lane were there, um, you know, that's when Battle had just come out. It was... And it was the first time that Radio 1 had ever, ever, ever gone there. So, but listen, we, we were doing that bit. You guys were doing your bit. Like, everyone was, everyone was contributing. You know, Kelly was there signing autographs, taking pictures. Yeah. Hugging just, people. Yeah. Hugging people. <laughs> yeah. Setting up a kissing stall. <laughs> it's crazy to look back on it, because I remember at that time, like, we were literally superstars in Iron Upper. Come on. Like, it was crazy. Now, I've got an interesting story myself. Um, and Fon E and more people's hair remember it clearly. We were running so late for the um, to catch a plane back to the UK. And this is no word of a lie. This is just that like, the power of the garage music and the, the artists at the time um, in Iron Upham. 
we were in the car with George. Remember, such a boy, George. Remember, the big yeah, star. Such a boy. Such a boy. Such a boy. Um, anyway, we're in the car and we're racing to get back to the airport. Um, in fact, we're panicking, thinking that we're going to miss this flight. And George is taking his melly old time, just driving, laughing, uh, uh, smoking. You could smoke. You could smoke. <laughs> and everyone was smoking. Everyone... You could smoke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you could smoke. <laughs> Everyone's smoking this on the way to the airport and we're thinking like, okay, like, like we, we know about being late, but this is pushing it. And no word of a lie, we've got all the way to the airport and the flight should have gone and George has made a phone call and actually held the plane. No word of a lie, he actually held the plane for me, Fonty and Mighty Mo. We had, to, had the plane waiting and when we got on, it's like we wanted the whole floor to swallow us because we was that late and we got and everyone looking around but like that was the magnitude. I, I, I kid you not right and I, I won't mention names but I can remember more than one occasion uh, in 2000 so there was uh, the major football tournament that year and some of the players that didn't make the England squad so they were playing every week for their football team their club side and they just missed out on making the England squad so these were proper name brand footballers Pedigree. and we'd be walking down the road and people would stop us and ask them to take a picture of us with them <laughs> so you've got these premier league footballers taking pictures of of timmy mikey or myself yeah. and that's that's no like no lie that's how big that's how big garage was and how big as djs yeah. and mcs we were in that resort at the time yeah. ridiculous crazy madness I, I, wanna, I mean, we could talk about Iron Apple all day. I just want to throw one last thing in, and someone's got to say something about it. Um, Insomnia's club. There was a club called Insomnia's. That yes. was like the after party in Iron Apple. So no matter where you was playing, um, there's various nights going on. But no matter where you played, you would end up in Insomnia's. So Spoonie could be at one Sun City. We could be at Garage Nation, for example. But no doubt everyone on the island would meet at Insomnia's for the after party. 20 minutes or so for me. It was a bit gully for me, mate. Oh, it, was very, it was very, very <laughs> gully. And, and I remember one year, everyone got a chest infection. Because I think there was like... Kelly. <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. Head, head of infection department. <laughs> <laughs> I was patient zero. No, like, there was, I think there was something going on with the AC and, and everyone got it in insomnia. So everyone that went insomnia ended up with a chest infection one year. And also there was a little secret back room in Insomnia oh, as well. Yes. Yeah. Oh gosh. What is someone to mention that? You know, like when like it was so long ago, like sometimes I think, was it a dream? Like did it really even happen? Yeah, no, I can confirm it definitely wasn't a dream. <laughs> um, I pinched myself more than once. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give a quick overview and then we'll move on. In some years, um, it was run by, we'd have to say gangsters, um, Costas Jamboree. Um, Definitely. Yeah, this was a very serious place. And as Kelly said, it had a secret room. There was a part, it was like a James Bond door. You could press a part of this wall and it was like almost like a revolving door. And, and was it, no, it didn't revolve. I think you pressed it, it, it yeah, 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 yeah. And you could go in there and... And this again, people are going to think, what the heck? There was a monkey in the back of this club. I don't remember the monkey. I wasn't there long enough. <laughs> well, <laughs> there was a monkey in the back of the club. Maybe I, maybe I was buzzing that particular <laughs> night. But I mean, right, like it's I said, because you could smoke. You know I mean? Like <laughs> I said, we're moving on. It's because you could smoke. Very, it's very, you could very, smoke. very, very swiftly. Um, Z bias. Let's, yeah. let's 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 talk back to you. Right. Let's talk about. Um, can we touch on it briefly? The sanctuary in Milton Keynes, yeah. which again, if. Um, <coughs> Coliseum is definitely a, a cornerstone for garage music, but the sanctuary is definitely like it's almost the mecca of clubs. It was placed in the centre of the UK, yeah. um, kind of Milton Keynes. Tell us a bit about that and some experiences okay. in that club. So it started in '92, and um, it was next to a, a big roller skating rink called Rollers. So what the bigger promoters would do is they'd rent out the sanctuary. And then they'd rent out rollers as well, and they'd set up a like a Ferris wheel and a, a like a thing outside, and they'd join the two together. So you'd have a joint um, like 8,000 capacity, I think it was, and there was 30 of us on the door. 30 for 8,000. 30. 30. <laughs> so, so 
but a lot of it, you know, you're talking about secret rooms. A lot, there were secret rooms there too, mm. but not the kind of ones you want to get dragged into. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we'll leave that you know, right yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, look, it, it was a big club. There was probably uh, a lot of people that, from up and down the country mm. um, that would not come for the music. They'd come because they'd see an easy picking, you know, people off their heads. They're, they're going to go there, try and rob yeah. a few heads. A lot of cash. Yeah, like, or knock o over the person on the champagne bar empty the champagne bar out or whatever. I'm, luckily, I never got to see any of the serious, serious stuff. Like, there was guns. There, there was, notoriously, if it was raining, mm. there'd be water coming through the bullet holes in the roof. It was, yeah, it was pretty. Yeah. I touched metal in, gun, in, in someone's pocket a few times, but there was a seven-foot guy behind me called Bangers, yeah? Who had, like, a torch, like, that, and, like, big boots up to here, and I was just, if ever I thought, nah. Six pound an hour. Yeah, sea bangers. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, but it, mu musically, sorry, right? So that no, was, no, that no. We want the whole picture. This is this is it. We want so, the... so musically, I worked there from '94 to '96, and I got kind of um, the the glory period of jungle and hardcore. A little bit like techno wasn't my thing, but we had like huge techno acts come in. And it was, yeah, it was good. It was, a, I didn't know what a baseline was before that. I used to, right, so there was a moment, I can define the moment, yeah, <laughs> like, anybody that knows drum and bass and jungle will feel this. Um, Shy FX, same age as me, actually, I think, or maybe even a little bit younger, I'm not sure. He walks in with his record bags, and, and I, my job is to carry him to the thing, well, you know, clear a path through the, the crowd. So I'm carrying his, dub plate box, he puts it up on by the decks and he pulls out this one dub, he's like, see this. <laughs> right, and he gives me the look at it, yeah? yeah. So, I'm, I don't know what to expect. He puts it on and it was like a delayed reaction of about 20 seconds of like, what's this? And then it just went batshit crazy. And it was the first time he played Bambata. Ooh. Bambata, like, for, for anybody that knows, like, it changed the face of everything we knew as jungle or whatever. Mm. It was like, oh, you could go over there as well, all right, okay. So Latin's now a thing, jazz is a thing, African rhythms. Are... Oh, yes, Fonz. Yeah, yes, man, on it. Love that. This, this tune here, yeah. So I was one, I was literally, like, that, that close to him when he played it for the first time. Must wow. Have, must have cut yeah. that music house. Wow. Yeah. yeah, Leon would have cut that for him. That was in 94, that, Leon was, into, yeah. that was 30 years ago. Leon would have been too young then. Yeah. Adam. Yeah, no, it would, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was probably Paul. So, to put it into perspective, yeah, I, I obviously didn't know he was then, but 30 years later, like earlier this year, I played at Shy FX's thing at Warehouse Project. Wow. Um, I've had the release on his label, do you know, like, I wouldn't say we're mates, but we're heavy, level respect for each other. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny, like, where you start out and where you can drift up, drift to. And to yeah, no, you know, that, that is literally the power of music. I mean, any genre, but especially garage, you know, where we all kind of, I mean, of us really, we grew up in kind of, um, and you know what, we made so many friends. Well, you said you was fire. We made so many friends in garage music, long-lasting relationships, you know, and people yeah. who we literally, like, Kelly call each other brother and sister and stuff like that, and that, that is a real testimony to the music, man. It's... Yeah. And it's such a nice genre to be in. Like, there's no beef. Like, everyone... There's a little bit. Well, it's not life. Joking, not no, but I'm saying it's life. We're not always going to see yeah. eye to eye. Like, even like you said, we had our little, we've had our little discrepancies. Did we? But, yes. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but. See, I but, didn't even know. But, but we always love each other, and that's, that's it. Do you know what I mean? There's no beef, there's no drama. We talk the thing, and then we sort it out, and then we're back again. No. And that's one of the things I love about being in this genre. It's just a beautiful genre. Obviously, I'm a solo artist, I go most places by myself, but I know I'm never alone. And that's the beauty. Yeah. Love it, yes. <laughs> you know, I think, I think one of the, um, being, being a member of the Dream Team, I sort of had to live the experience of working with other people and being considerate and being respectful and not, it not just being about what I wanted to play or where I wanted to play, J just like you, you, you Fonty and Mo working together. But once you expand that a little bit, you realize that 
our real strength is collectively, not just right. not just as an outfit. You know, Heartless is big, but if Heartless are linking up with Dream Team or with So Solid or as Pay As You Go or doing a collaboration with Zed Bias or getting Kelly to feature on something, you then that's the grow excellent. That's where the real power is, and I think. You know, after all of this time, the fact that we can all sit here, you know, I, you know, one of your first releases was signed to our label. And here we are, 25 years later, sat next to each other on a panel. Like, that fills me with, uh, with a certain amount of pride and joy that, wow, relationships have been nurtured over that period of time. Do you know what I mean? So, um, it, it is a beautiful thing. And even with you guys, you know, as, as the kind of the next wave yeah. coming through, thinking, boy, these men have got a vibe going on in there. Do you know what I mean? And it, but it's a, it's a lovely thing. I, lo I, I, love, I love the vibe. We're vibes people. You know what I mean? No, man. We've had our little bits and bobs. Have we? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm falling out with everyone. I don't even know. What's going on? <laughs> no, Speedy, it's because you was like the boss, you know. What? Yeah. Hey, sorry, man, the bus. I'll just say honestly that like, when we come into this thing, Tooney, I mean, you had the car top and off Browns and the Matt Jamlin Mont and them man there. But Spoonie, when you came in, you was like the boss. Even though it was a dream team, Mikey B team, Magic and Spoonie, you was like the front man. So what you said held a lot of don't call you out. Yeah. And, and you know you, Spoonie, you're very opinionated. <laughs> Yeah. That's never been said before. Yeah, very opinionated. <laughs> and I remember when we was coming through Heartless Crew, even just hearing the name Heartless Crew, I know Spoonie's probably thinking, what are these guys going to do to this lovely Garage music now? This is the Heartless Crew. And when we, ca when we came into Garage, there wasn't no rewinds and them kind of things there. No, that, that no, was when the Bashman dance hall. We was doing that in the dance hall. That wasn't in the Garage. So when we come and started doing that in the Garage and chatting, these guys, they wasn't happy. The elders, they wasn't happy. They thought we was going to mash up the thing and not respect it properly. So I do remember, maybe not directly to, towards us, but I remember you not really gravitating towards the way how these, the younger ones with the energy... It's sweating now, for No, no, no. It's sweating, it's sweating. I've, 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 I've had, you know, this kind of allegation aimed at me for, uh, forever and ever. But you, you know what it was? I think that... I think one of the things, and I, I'm almost, I'm gonna almost take it as a bit of a compliment. The thing was that I kind of, I always had this kind of vision that we could do more than what we were doing. But in order to do that, we just needed to sort of like polish the edges a little bit. We needed to kind of look at our, our work or our industry with more, a more business lens on it than just being guys that come off the estate. Because I'm thinking, wow, we're, we're filling clubs, we're in the charts, but all of us are still, like, we're on a market stall. Like, why are, we, why are we behaving like this? We can slicken up what we're doing a little bit and we can hit the levels. So, you know, I, I guess that's what it is. Yeah. Or oh, that's what you. it was. Oh, thank you. And here we are now. Yeah. You know, here we are now. Exactly. Bushkin, MC Bushkin, Bushwhacker, <laughs> is hosting a talk at the British Library. Case in point. <laughs> Case in point. No. Say, say, say yeah. Yes. Now, uh, um, I must chime in, you know, because definitely there was that apprehension when we came about, and I know you was a bit like, mm, these guys. But I remember speaking to you, that was, I'll, I'll quickly throw it in there, you set up some kind of panel to kind of, um, kind of eradicate the crew. That's a lie. I, I, well, but anyway, hold That's on. That's a lie. But I will say, like, um, But we were a crew. There's three of us, we're a crew. You had three of you as well, we were yeah, a crew. That's right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I will say this in, in um, Spoon's defense. Years later, I remember doing a photo shoot with you at a record shop, and we spoke, and we had a really good adult conversation, and obviously I matured up and whatever. And I remember one line you, you, you said to me, and you, one thing I got, you, you kind of always been true to yourself. And one line I remember you saying was like, the cream always rises to the top, and we had a proper conversation about the journey, and just, like you said, tidying things up and not being rough around the edges, and what we could achieve if we work together and do things properly. And like you said, we are here today, so it's definitely a testimony yeah, that's, that's, to your that's character. That's all it is. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got to say I'm proud You're passionate. of... I'm, not only am I passionate, but I'm proud of the people that I work around. Like, I will hold him up as a producer like any other in this country. He's a garage. Kelly's voice, I've worked with Kelly for years. I would hold her up. I'm proud of my people. But what happens is, is that sometimes you have to have, 
you know, you have conversations that are, that people might not want to hear, but because you can see what they have in them, they might not be able to tell themselves. But it's like, come, fix up, we can do this. And then you get a bit of pushback, but then you get down the line and people go, oh, yeah, I, I, I kind of get what you mean now. You get what you, because I wasn't smoking. Zip, so. you, you, <laughs> a, a year I'm ago, shame. maybe two years ago, you sent me a text out of the blue. And you said, um, how you doing, Zed? Um, wishing you nothing but greatness. Um, I'm working with, like, in certain life, I'm paraphrasing, but in certain live aspects, and I see you as one of the, the people from our scene that could take it to that big stage with your music in a live aspect. And that lit a fire under my backside. Well, I, I called you and thanked you, and that's probably, like, why we're as cool as we are now, to be honest, because you actually didn't have to give me that little nugget, and it actually was the right thing. I needed to hear that, actually. Because, you know, when you... Let me big up the cast from Smassive, Wagwan, guys. We're going to be coming to you very soon. I know you've got some questions there, so big up the cast from his crew. Um, you know what? Ah, time is flying. We are going to get to you guys as well. I know you must have loads of questions, and everyone wants to throw Spoonie under the bus, so <laughs> it's all good. Um, you know what? I want to talk about the independence of garage music and everyone kind of making their own destiny and us kind of just going through it and you know, putting, selling records up from the boot and then charting and just ten, becoming superstars. Kelly, let's, let's, let's talk. I'm the wrong person to start with. I didn't sell anything out of my boots. <laughs> I was at my label at the time, but to be fair, I did leave them not long after that. Okay. Yeah. Um. Um, but um, I think I was just before the big blow up of Garage into the commercial scene. Okay. Um, so literally, I was before Rewind, um, Craig David, mm. I was before um, Flowers. I, was j I, I just missed that window. But to be honest, I could have re released My Love, but. I'd already had a top 10 hit with the original, so I didn't want to be greedy. I was like, let yeah. some other people get some shine. But yeah, no, I, 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 my love was just before that, to okay. be fair. Zed? You're talking to Mr. DIY. This is, this is who I want to talk to, yes. No, I've, I've yeah, obviously Sidewinder, yeah. that was 25 years ago. Um, Sidestepper was a sister label. Debutante. And then there's other, like, other, labels where I've kind of helped the birth of it and just not just let it go, do its thing. So I've literally been running independent labels for the best part of like 26, 27 years. Uh, and I've still got one. I, IFG, I feel good. IFG. Nice. Mm -hmm. In yeah, case I, like I forget it. to I feel like good. It. I like it, I like it. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, release number five in a year, vinyls, I'm making vinyls still. Now? It's, yes, now. Love that. Yeah, and it's a labour of love. You know, this is something that I want to do until I just, uh, well, kick the bucket, innit? Like, too late to find another job now, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be doing this well into pension so you years. know you can be a coder? <laughs> I could retrain, innit? Yeah, that's why as well. Rishi, if I listen to Rishi, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The security, would, security be, hourly rates have gone up. I'll be Sainsbury security right now. That's what I would be. Yeah. No, it's too late. I'll be doing. I'll be selling vinyls, not out of the boot. Juno, you know, I've, I've gone up from the car boot. Yeah, yeah he's leveled up. We, we, we still record shops and yeah. mail order and band camp, but yeah, we're doing it. Yeah, I love it. Um, Spoonie, the, the underground turned into the overground um, and Garage just exploded on TV, it was everywhere. Everyone wanted to be in the Garage scene. Labels got in, there was a load of money being thrown around. A lot of the artists were getting signed for stupid fees. Um, and it was a kind of a, a turning point. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, when we, when, we say, when we say stupid, they were absolutely worth the money they were signing for. It was a lot of money. Yes. Um, and compared to, compared to our counterparts in other genres, there's no reason why we shouldn't have been getting that kind of money. And that's, those are the kind of conversations that, you know, I was having with people to say, you know, make sure you get your worth. But 
get your team patterned up so when you go and you can ask for that, yeah. you, can, you, you can get that. But yeah, I think, listen, the, the, the power of the music, radio was, a, radio was a big thing because if you think of the world sort of pre Spotify and other streaming services, because there are other streaming services available. That's me with my BBC head on after. Um, but pre that time, it was, the only place you could hear it would be in the club or like on the radio. So when we when we got that national platform, it just took it from to another to another area in the sense of, I suppose, the big cities around the country, Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, Swansea, Swansea and Cardiff were massive for garage yep. as well, that they were always going to get it. Um, but it was the, the small areas in between, like a, a Derby or an Ipswich or a crew. Now that we're on national radio, it then meant that all of these areas would be serviced. And therefore, everyone that's associated with the scene, they can, book, they, they can book the Dream Team one week, but then you can't book us every week. Oh, well, we're, now we're going to book Zed Bias. Well, can you get a PA? Yeah, we're going to have Kelly LaRock and Elizabeth Troy. Do you know the Heartless crew? Yeah, we know them. They might turn up late smoking, but they're, they're good. <laughs> hey, get out of there, Sweeney. Get out of there, they'll, they'll give you a good. They'll give you a great party. And, and, and that's, and that's kind of how it, you know, that's kind of how it spreads. And to be honest with you, that was... We, 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 we started an agency. We, we actually had the first garage agency because we couldn't service... The Sarah. The amount, we couldn't, huh? Sarah. Then Sarah worked for us. Yeah. 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 We, I was we couldn't have mentioned that. Yeah. We still owed money. Yeah. Funny enough, but hey. But we we, <laughs> we couldn't service the requests, so we thought we might as well set up a, an agency and then give the gigs to, to other people. Collective power. No, I love it. I love it, Sweeney. Again, I've got to give you. I've got, I've got to give you. A, I've got to give you a flowers. Um. I want to talk about someone, she's not here, but she's definitely an icon for garage music um, and for UK music in general, Miss Dynamite. She came into the scene um, as a black woman and just won the spearheads. And um, I think it's really important to, to throw her into the conversation and what she's done for garage. Also, a fellow North London with us. Once, uh, yeah, we, we have to give Miss Dynamite. Miss Dynamite's I'm, I'm, almost I'm, the conversation. She's almost the conversation on her own. You could have yeah. your own Miss Dynamite conversation. That's right. I'm lucky I've, I've, I've made a few tracks of us. <laughs> yeah, Miss Dynamite, yeah. so you can see that? You could. Yeah. <laughs> you could. I, I met um, Naomi when she was 19, I think she'd just done Boo. Mm -hmm. And we was doing, a, it was a middle row studio, mm -hmm. a Battle of the MCs project. So there was me, Specialist Moss, um, there was uh, so, Suburban Lick, which was yes. me, uh, Sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and um, Miss Dynamite, I did a track with Miss Dynamite, Sweetie Irie and Speak, called, um, I don't know, but I had F-U-C-K in the title. Oh. Um, <laughs> lads. So, yeah, done that. I've done, a, I've done a couple, another couple. I've remixed um, It Takes More as well. <laughs> <laughs> this, this you thought I couldn't hear it, innit? That, well, give us a bit of volume, give us my sense. Yeah. Boo's just an incredible song. We had, we had, we had, we had murders with, um... Hey, you know, it got big up sticky on the production for this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we have to hate, just said it. We have to hate up hard. The gyms are sticky. C C One of the UK's yeah, great. For real. One of the UK's greatest. You know, could I add a quick random fact? A random fact about this track and sticky. Go on. One day. <laughs> One day. <laughs> sticky, as you know, used to play in a sound called the Ill Kids. Yeah. He was playing in Psycho. Wolverhampton with us. Heartless Crew was in room one and the Ilkis in room two because they play Bashment R&B and all that business, yeah? We was in room one playing the garage. As people know, during the reload, we would do something different and flinging something from a different genre, you know, in this room. <laughs> and we played a lovely reggae tune by Court the Melody called Dangerous and the place went off. Yeah. Anytime I come, I come, Dangerous. Pulled it up, went back into the garage. But little did we know that Sticky 
finished his set and was in the crowd listening. And Sticky wasn't into Garage those times there. And he come and told me personally, he said, Fonz, after I heard you play that in the dance and I saw the way the dance went off, that evening, I went home and I made boo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, what? Lovely stories. I couldn't <laughs> believe that. Sticky, amazing. Sticky, Sticky, Sticky's another, another amazing guy associated with, uh, with our scene. Uh, another brilliant, brilliant producer. Produced so many bangers, but... Just going back to uh, when Boo came out. So when that was released, we were on Radio 1 at the time. And by far and away, it was the biggest record in all of our record boxes. So on any given Saturday night, you know, Timmy might have been playing in Bognor. Mikey might have been playing in Manchester. I might have been playing in, in Birmingham. And we'd come back to do the show on a Sunday and we'd say, you know, what, what was the tune? tune? And everyone would be like... Boy, I, I, I had to rewind Boo four times. I rewind it five times. That, and this is not an exaggeration. And you go, yeah, you'd understand that. They're the big cities. Yeah, but what about, what about when we, we played it in Ipswich? No, it was the same. So, so then, at the time, when records were released, you, as a DJ, you'd get it for six, maybe eight weeks before it got properly released. Oh, yeah. So the record company then were releasing it, and it comes up to Playlist. So Playlist of what the stations the tracks that they're playing every day. And they were like, this record's too hard. <laughs> and we're like, this is the biggest record out there. Now it's too hard. So if you remember, they sent it back, they went back and they produced a kind of watered it down yeah. kind of, you know when someone gives you oh, Ribena, yeah. he gives you Ribena, Tim, but yeah. you can see right through the glass. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go back to their house. Like, I, when I've got Ribena, I don't want to see through the glass. Mm -hmm. So they, they did this kind of watered-down version, and we, would, we almost we refused to play it. We're like, no, we're playing, we're playing the original sticky version. We'll have a, a radio edit in length, but, I mean, I, 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 I could sit here and do an hour on Miss Dynamite. They said it was too what? Huh? They said it was too what? It was too hard. Hard meaning black? No, just like, the bass, the bass <laughs> I mean, maybe. It was too loud. It was like the bass was mixed down incredibly loud, like louder than any other tune. It was Am I right? Yeah. It's like, it's like almost to the point it's distorted on every single sound system. Yeah. But and that's what people liked that's about what, it. Yeah. But, but you know, it's weighty. It's, it, most things, when you distort it, you, you lose the weight the more you distort yes. a signal. So it's got maximum distortion, but it's got the weight there as well. It's yeah. like... And I think you that's testimony to Sticky, because he is a prolific He's producer. my favourite garage producer, Sticky, yeah. Rich. Yeah. He, yeah. he is cold, like I've been many nights at his house and he's just playing me so many tunes on different genres. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just talking and mentoring me and, yeah. And he's also classically trained, so like, that's why Triplets has got like, yeah. the classical element. One of my favourites, that. But you know, it's funny you told that story, Fonty, because that's another thing that I really love about UKG, that it has so many different kind of influences from different kind of genres mm. and they all work like you can play a bashy garage tune then you can yeah. play a soulful garage tune then you can play a funky garage tune <coughs> and they all just work together and that's one of the things that's really special about ukg that it doesn't have one sound that's a great that's point you know? can, I, can i can i elaborate on this and ask a want. little question please right with your opinion basically so there was a, a phenomenon um probably around 99 2000 where Everything was severely swingy. One of the, the biggest attributes, if you like, of Garage, the way you identify it was it was swingy. Mm -hmm. and it you was, mean the two-step? Yeah, it was, yeah, the, the drums, even that, like the 4-4 stuff was really swingy. It had a shuffle um, and that's how you knew. But then certain people started making records that didn't have the shuffle in it and it was breakbeat. Mm -hmm. oh. And then it all changed and then there was a period where certain big tunes wouldn't mix into another tune. Do you know what I'm on about, folks? He's a good mixer, so he so I just wanted to you. hear your opinion on it, because obviously, I, at that time, I was making tunes, I wasn't playing them. Yeah, yeah, you know what? It did... I was part of the problem. <laughs> you're right, it did get pretty techy. Yeah. Pre it did get pretty techy. You gotta know where you're going in the journey. You can't just pick any two tunes, just... After 138 Trek, basically, he... everything changed, didn't it? Yeah, but even before 138 Trek, because you had that people like Steve Gurney yeah. that was doing some crazy kind of beats, you know what I mean? Yeah. You had Brass Tooth, he yeah. come with that kind of doop, doop. And there was no swing in that either, exactly. Brass Tooth, yeah, yeah. He did the Latin style, didn't he? Yeah, the soca yeah. style, yeah. yeah. Boom, boom. But yeah. altogether, it was it was amalgamation. That's what made Gary so good because yeah. 
the DJs wouldn't even play all the different. They've got their niche that they like to play. And that's what was so amazing. It wasn't like you hear the same garage set every time. Or nowadays, when you hear a garage set, you just hear the same tunes every time. People think all there is is I'm sorry, flowers, and, you know, let your body groove. They don't realise there's so much, you know, different. depth in the garage music. And it was the journey that made those tunes there that I just mentioned big anyway, you know? Mm -hmm. When it come to the crescendo, when you hear the flowers, oh, I bring you flowers. It was like, oh yeah, that was nice now, ready for that. It wasn't just the tune at the beginning of the set. So yeah, you're right. The production, it went crazy. From, from it went two step, from the never let you go, them to destiny and those kind of tunes there. And then when you got producers like you, producers like Spoon and Lock coming, they just, they just took it on another level. Another level. I, I was always amazed. I just loved the music. Loved it, loved it. Still do love it to this day. You know, um, I will say, because we are, time is definitely ticking, so we're going to throw it out to you guys soon. So, um, yeah, get your questions ready. And also online, I can see you've got some questions. So, yeah, we're definitely going to come to you guys soon. Um, just want to throw a few more things into the mix before we do. Um, question to any of my panelists. How well has, has Garage aged? Um, just leading them from what you were saying about the tunes. Well, I would say it hasn't aged. It's timeless. And it's so mad because, you know, you had um, Daniel doing Garage Classical the other day. And he was like, it's really good, isn't it? Garage has come back. And I went, babe, where you been? It's not gone anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm working every weekend. I guess maybe because he went straight to mainstream and then he didn't go into the underground aspect of it. But whilst Garage did have its kind of mainstream day, it, it went back on, onto the underground and literally we work all the time. There was a period where I signed on and off for four years, but other than that, I've been good. Well, you know. we're getting the tea, Sarah, we're getting the tea. Like I said, she has no filter. No, I'm the just, tea. I'm a human being. I'm telling, I'm telling the truth, it's facts, isn't it? I love that. We're all, we're all learning today. That's what I mean, it hasn't, for me, for Spoonie, I guess it's what, like, we've worked consistently, so it's just like, it's not gone anywhere. Yes, yeah, so, listen, like any, like any business, some, some years were, were better, than, be, better than others, but I think because we were trying to do things properly, um, that you come, you come out the other side and here we are. I mean, I, I speak, it, it's, it's funny because in the volume of work, I don't think we are, well, I know we're not as busy as we were, the scale of the shows and the events we're doing now are way bigger. Because in, in our heyday, we weren't hosting events at the British Library. We didn't have a garage weekender. No, we weren't doing Royal Albert Hall. You weren't doing, doing your own residency at one of London's top venues. I mean, she's on TV. She, like, we weren't doing these things in the heyday. So even though we might not be doing three or four gigs every Saturday, when you look at the, the size of the events that we're doing, yeah, it's bigger. It's I don't know, what do you, what you think? Yeah, we're still doing quite a lot of gigs every week. And it's right? nostalgia I mean, music as well, isn't it? <laughs> you need it's to like, put your prices up then. It's nostalgia, like people, uh, people can't are people that nostalgia. Like you can't all be Come on. Do you well, know you what can. I mean? But you can. Well, not, not you, you, you are you. And we, we love you for you. <laughs> <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm finding is the new kids, the new breed have breathed life into Garage. So it's not that we can constantly look at ourselves as a retro thing. Now we fit into the, this kind of a bigger journey that's led up to this conclusion, which is now yeah. kids love it again. And there's young DJs, there's young singers, young producers out there doing what we did. And, you know, we, they're not saying, right, we're doing it now, do one. I'm getting booked more as a, as a, you know, yeah, yeah, a yes, consequence. Yeah. So, I'm supporting that, and, uh, and long may that continue. We'll be here 40 years of you in mean, garage. I mean, they're booking you. I'm not getting booked. I must have had an argument with them. Your price is too high. You're, you're you know, you don't know about them. I must have had an argument with them. I've fallen out with them. I never met them before. Yes. Um, you know, I'm going to flick to this little picture here. Bring back some real memories. I know Kelly said there's, there's not... Smoke. There's hardly any beef in this scene, but um, we did have a friendly clash with pay as you go back in the days. Um, How'd that go? Very bad for them, but I mean... <laughs> um, the thing is, these, he, you, you can't say it because it's your... But, like, don't clash heartless. That's their, that's their speciality subject. We call, we call them out 
for that. <laughs> so if you hear anything named Clash, just don't do it with them because it's only going to end one way. That's that's my take on it. Like I'm not, I know my onions. I, you say yeah, let's clash. What am I clashing with you for? Like it's pointless. And that's and that's what it should be to them other guys. Just but, know know your thing, know what you're good at, and do what and do what you do. That's theirs. Leave that to them. That should never say verses. That should just say heartless. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. All right, we are going to get to some questions. You know what? Quickly, because I did really want to ask, and I know it's a very tricky question, so just first tune that comes to your head. Favourite garage tune of all time? Well, it's Boo, isn't it? Boo? It's Boo. I love that. It's Kelly. I'm going to say... Including your own. You come... I'm going to say Enough is Enough by Elizabeth Troy. Yeah. yeah. I, like. I love the sentiment of the track. It's really empowering. <laughs> you're spontaneous, buddy. You're, 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 you're amazing. You're like a funny, mate. You're like brilliant. Yes. Fun, fun. Yes. Spoonie, deep I'm not thought. answering that stupid question. In deep thought. <laughs> In deep thought, Spoonie. It's hard, isn't no, it? No, it's, it's, it's... Yeah, because it, funny is right there saying today because... If you ask me this question seven days in a week, I'll give you seven different answers because it, it very much depends on, on my mood, you know mm. what I mean? Um, I, I, even, today, to, even today, I started the sentence, it was one song. I got to the middle in my head, it became another song. It's not that easy. So, I so, mean, I, do it now. Uh. You know what? I think, I think... Like, Boo would always be there because it was groundbreaking and pioneering in one way. And I, and I think that the greatness has to be more than just the actual construction of the track. It's he like didn't what say stands... the greatest yeah. song. <laughs> My friend, yeah, but I, 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 I'm wired in, in, in that he's way. A, he's a diplomat. Uh, no, 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 he's it's, like it's, it's, turned into it's, the prime minister. It's, it's not that. <laughs> it's, it's not that. Don't dare call me that again in public. <laughs> Right. <laughs> anyway, but no, you know what? I, 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 even though it technically isn't a UK garage record, um, Gabriel by Pevan Everett and Boy. I Boy love Boy. that song. That is so a beautiful one. That is a beautiful song. And it's set up already for you. <laughs> and actually, that was one of the first songs that I heard as a garage song that made me fall in love with garage as well. Beautiful. Okay, you have to. It is garage. It's not UKG, but it's garage. garage. Yeah. Big up Uncle Roy. Try. Mm -hmm. And if you come to Garage Classical, Spoonie plays the trombone on this song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you tried. Right. Oh, uh, no. Push. Uh, uh, this, this, this record, right? I think. The reason being that, so that, that record was He's got to get to the question. Yeah, but this is important. All right. He's only got 16 minutes. We're going to overrun. <laughs> it's the heartless truth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right? <laughs> the, um, the, the reason this record... <laughs> you like that one point, isn't it? Oh, cool, cool. The, the, the reason I always mention this record, because it wasn't by our scene, for our scene, it was adopted by our scene, become, it's become one of the most favoured records in our scene, but I love it because it is such a pure record that you could play in and around neighbourhood, you could play in and around things we do, Heartless Theme, and people, it just stops them in their track. And I tell you, man, we, we do this at Garage Classical, Lifford sings it, we, 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 we've reimagined it, stripped it down. <laughs> so it's, it, it's really orchestral. It's, it sounds like a hymn and it brings tears to my eyes when I hear it. Literal tears. It is I'm really not, beautiful. I'm not saying words. It makes me... It, even you putting it on there gives me goosebumps. And when we did Kew Gardens and the sun was set in and it was... It was... It was so beautiful. It's too much. It's too much. So yeah, it's it too so much. And the emotion that it invokes for different reasons, I'm like... I want to say battle, I want to say boo, but I'm just saying we've got three kings and queens at the top there. I can't choose between them three records. Sorry. We'll take that, we'll take that, we'll take that. Perfect, perfect. You know what? Perfect timing. I want to throw it out to you guys now. Um, I hope you've been entertained. I know you have 
some questions. There's some mics out in the crowd. That's We've got some lights on. So anyone for any questions, you just put your hand up and we'll get a mic to you. We've got a guy up there in the back row, but I want to choose the lady here with her hand up because we're going to go ladies first because we're gentlemen. No. Um, thanks for sending me the flyer, by the way. It's Lola. <laughs> oh, is that, yes, no um, worries. No, one, my pleasure. Gonna say, who's going to open Coronet version 2.0? Like, what are we saying? Who's Has gonna... anyone got plans to open a place? Because I feel like there's no... There's no, like, garage clubs or house clubs that it's all events. So has anyone got any plans to actually open somewhere? Or oh, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was going to do it. Everyone started arguing with me, so I just... Oh, all right. <laughs> all right. We'll talk about it after, yeah? We won't argue. Okay. Yeah. I just thank you, guys. I it's think really we need an Iron Up Heart garage reunion. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I keep saying that. I, yeah. I don't have the infrastructure, like, because I don't... Yeah, I don't put on events, so I don't have the mailing list. But I, I put think on events. a few big, like... Promoters should get together and we should do like a big like week out there with all the old school people and just rave it up. Yeah, it sounds just amazing. wait there, just wait there, Kelly. Spoon is, spoon is in his phone book. <laughs> no, it's, it's one better than that. Back to Napa, October 2025. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, He's on yeah. it. He's on job. I like so that. We're all I going. We're all going. Decided. We're all going, yeah? Like we're all going, yeah? And I, c I can confirm, I had no arguments getting that together. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully after the last incident at the Butlins weekend, we will still be on the lineup. Say no more. <laughs> yes, really. Right, we won't talk about that. Um, talk, any... about, talk about it if you want. <laughs> any, any more questions out there? Oh, we got, we got someone there. Bushkin, you missed her. She had a hand up for ages. No, the lights in, in the my corner, face. Yeah, I couldn't actually see. see you there, in fairness. I wanted to know, why did the mayor ban Garage in United yeah. Park? Yeah, right. Idiot So what happened was, you know, there was like, it just got ridiculous. It was like, like Birmingham guys, London guys, and it just kept kicking off all the time. I remember there was a few times where it was really horrible, where there was like fighting on the streets and they smashed all the glasses and like, and all the front of the bars. It just was, there was chairs everywhere. It just went nuts. And to be honest, like the guys in Cyprus do not play. They do not mess around. They will take out their kosher and beat you. Even if you're a girl, they will beat you. They do not business. So it just all got on top. And the mayor was just like, enough. So she, she stopped it for a couple of years. And then there was no money. So then she had to, re <laughs> she had to revoke it. <laughs> Spoiled by the few for the many. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. It was ridiculous, though. It was really scary, actually. When yeah. It was kicking off like that. I think you know as well um, the, how in Iron Up at that time, it, and though it was making them like so much money, the mess and the all the kind of the miss, yeah, the, that's like the tourism, the yeah. general tourism yeah. that yeah. gets put off. And if that's, you think if it's your business, yeah. you're, 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 send them home, man. That, that don't need this. That's right. But they bring us back. Yeah, they, they couldn't do about us. People yeah. got a bit older, they yeah. started learning how to behave a little bit better. And... Um, also, I, I, I don't want to, because Garage was really good, but I know that during the Napa time, grime was creeping in. Yeah, I know that the And grime brought a darkness. That definitely yeah. brought a darkness. Yeah, it did, it did. You know Throwing I mean? them under yeah. the bus. Yeah, that's out of Throwing them under the bus. No, 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 funny, funny, that's out of order, bro. We leave that right there. Let me, let me get a question for Funny, that's out of order, man. Let, let me get a question from the. Uh, <laughs> I can't castle. believe you said that in public, bro. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to have the whole grime scene on him tomorrow. Let me get a question from Carswom. Um, Irish O says, where did the name Garage come from? It's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, you know. I, I know it. Paradise, from, so Par the Paradise, Paradise Garage. Garage. Paradise Garage was a kind of disco house club in New York. And then Garage Music was associated with that as a venue. Then it was Garage and then it was UK Garage. US Garage and then UK Garage. Yeah. I first went raving to US Garage in 92 at AWOL. Yeah. Room 2 at AWOL. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wow, Angel a way of life. life, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jay. Classic. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't tell you. Jay was the promoter. It, yeah, it was played Mickey really Finn, fast. Mickey Finn, GQ. Oh, no, Richie Fingers. That would have been Richie Fingers. Mickey, yeah, Mickey Finn was there. Yeah, yeah Mickey yeah, Finn would have yeah. been in room one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, CS Gast in the, in the queue going in. Yeah. Yeah. CS Gas Stage, yeah. that's a whole CS another Gas chapter yeah. in itself. Um, let me get another question from the cast room. Um, 
I see says, my question is, how has UK Garage evolved in the modern day? How's it evolved? Kelly? I'll be honest and say, I don't think it has. I know that there's new garage, which they call future garage or whatever. Um, and, and it's got its own movement and it's got its own scene, but I think there's a disconnect between old school garage and this new future garage. Because yeah. for me, it doesn't sound anything like garage as I know it. It just sounds like a brand new genre, which is probably why we got the name UKG, because we sounded nothing like Paris garage. Do you know what I mean? Um, so that's what I would say. I, I feel like it's a lot of old school music. And what's mad is people send me garage stuff all the time, and I'm like, nah, I don't like it. <laughs> I want old school garage. <laughs> send me four to the floor. Like, I really do not like, I don't even really like two step anymore. Like, to remake, I like more the older kind of purist. So I think a lot of the music, the, the, mu the way the music was made before was made for like a vibe. You're saying you were in the charts, but you wanted a track that was in the club. So you weren't thinking, big sales and a drop there and a chorus there and a the key of that. You were just thinking, I just want a tune that's made as a vibe. Mm. I think the difference is now mm. that everyone's trying to make that big tune that's going to be on TikTok or it's going to be at a festival. So then you lose a little bit of... It like becomes you lose contrived. A little bit of something. It yes. becomes contrived. Yeah. Yeah. Where if you're making it for and with <coughs> authentic reasons, yeah. then you get like a different... different. I, I personally, I, I don't like the whole... Next generation, Gary. Da, 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 da. If if you you said earlier, Kelly, the amount of different what could be subgenres in garage, but they're just called UK garage. Whether it's new or old, just call it garage. Then you ingratiate yourself into a bigger scene. Yeah. So the disconnect is because people are going, I'm not making that. Well, it is that. You're sampling that. It's at that tempo. Yeah. You're using that vocalist. It is that. If it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks. Duck, yeah. It it's a yeah. duck, isn't it? It's a duck. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Very. I, I, I would agree with that screen, you know. Definitely that it should definitely all come under the same banner because House and Garage, what we, we called it, it went into like, maybe we called it Speed Garage for one little piece, two step, and all that. And you're right, it was all still Garage. I mean, people say, how's Garage evolved, you know? But I would definitely say, Baseline is Garage. Mm. Grime is Garage. Funky's so, Garage. Funky House. Tribal is Garage. Is garage. Tribal is garage. Dubstep is garage. All of those, are, if you listen back to some of the, some tunes in garage, you will see they've got the dubstep feel, they've got the bass line feel, they've got the funky ass feel, they've got the grind feel. All of those are children of the mother of garage, in my eyes. I agree. I agree. Good point. Let's uh, see if there's any more questions in the Run there room. The I can't see. Oh, yeah, at the back for the middle there. Hi, great um, discussion. Um, I, so a couple of, of when I think back to, to Garage, and I was younger, so I wasn't raving during these times, but I was listening to the music. Um, garage for me feels like a really, really significant, a really, sim a really strong symbol of the time when it came out. Um, and you know, you hear like some low, um, nowadays artists talking about, oh, you know, Garage is softer, we don't make Garage. And we had this, it felt like it had a, a, a persona, either at the time or later on, of being kind of soft, materialistic, um, showy, yeah. um, and grime as a kind of antithesis to that. And I just wondered what two questions. One is, what do you think of that characterization of Garage? Was that does that resonate with you in terms of the lived experience? And then also, to what extent do you think that Garage was a product of the time that it came out? When you think of like politically, socially, in terms of, like, the environment that we're in. That sounds like a spoony <laughs> question. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and this is why I fall out with everyone, and I don't even know. But this is why I'm gonna be in the, I'm going to be in the newspaper tomorrow. <laughs> I fell out with someone in the British Library. I'll just answer the question. Um, I think it's, it's not an unfair characterization, but the truth is, at the time, we were having such a good time that we didn't really... We didn't really care. And in many ways, it was like the press and the media kind of used it as a bit of a, a stick against us. Like, oh, look at them having a good time. We're like, well, what, what are we doing wrong here? We're just kids from the estate having a good time. Like, what is, like, what is wrong with that? And in, in, in many ways, it almost made us, you know, stick our proverbial two fingers up at them. Um, I think that um, grime coming along in a way is a kind of counterculture. There would have been an element, 
there would have been an element of that. But the the creat creativity as a result of that, which sometimes happens, you know, you listen to, you go back and listen to Miles Davis or you listen to Marvin Gaye, you know, Marvin Gaye's greatest album is where he stood and looked at the world and said, this is a mess. His album was like one of the original counterculture albums. So sometimes magic comes out of that. And I don't think if you spoke to, if we go back and you speak to Wiley or Skepta or you speak to Stormzy a little bit later on or, or Chip or Kano, that they would felt that they were doing anything wrong. I mean, they are unbelievable lyricists, every single one of them. I mean, what they've done with their careers is phenomenal. And if that was born out of them addressing and creating balance, then I'm gonna turn around and say, as another guy from the estate, go and fill your boots. Like, go and do your thing, and, and we're happy for it. Yes, me. All right, let's see if we can get one more question down here. Got another one there and another one up there. Hello. Hi. Um, hey. Uh, so we've, we've, you've talked about, for you personally, what was like the, the best garage track, but what do you think is the most probably underrated garage track? I thought you going to say the one I hate the most. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that later. No, but, <laughs> what do you think is the most underrated garage track and maybe the underrated uh, garage, garage artist that didn't get enough attention? Steve Gurley. And anything you touch. Ed, Steve Gurley. That's, if you don't know who I'm talking about, please do Google him. The, the, the beat we know as, as Two Step, the blueprint of it, he made. Spirit of the Sun. Am I wrong? <laughs> like with the, with yes, do. But I'm not going to nitpick. Mm -hmm. You did it. I'm from your own kids and he's my mate, so... I love him. He's, I, I wish he was around still making music. Yeah. I wish yeah. Steve um, Gurley taught me everything, though, isn't Steve Gurley, very underrated, yeah. Um, I, 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 as a, as a producer, Steve Gurley, as a vocalist, I'd say Lifford. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's great. I, I like Lifford's voice is world class. He, his voice is fit for any stage in any company, yeah. in my opinion. Can't lie, he did smash it up on X Factor as well, is on there? He did. Yeah, but again, when, when you see people earning a living singing mm. and they can't sing, it just, it fries my head a little bit. <laughs> right, we'll leave that there. We're running out of time. The first so, second that um, Lippard is an amazing singer. What, the second uh, that's beautiful. Yeah, final words. Um, again, before I wrap up, thank you guys um, for coming down and, and getting involved in the session. Guys, final words on UK Garage, 30 years. One line from each of the panelists. Here's the 60 years. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, another milestone and I hope I'm here for it. Yeah, I've done that. Really, one line? <laughs> Why'd you say it like that? <laughs> You said it already, that's your line. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, just, I just hope we continue to fulfil and reach our potential and work together and, yeah, see where we go, man. No, I love that. Thank you. What's your line, Bruce? Go on, see what I've tried my line in. What's your line? Absolutely good, you know. It's, well, there you go. It's absolutely good, you know. That was good from you. <laughs> yes, girl. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, man, I've literally got about a minute left. I've got some slides. I'm going to run through them at the end just before we all get out there. Uh, remember, the exhibition is actually on until the 26th of August. That gives the organiser just enough time to feature some garage in there, because like I said, <laughs> <laughs> it's lacking well garage. Um, but yeah, please check it out. Um, Beyond the Baseline, 500 years of black British music. The exhibition is absolutely amazing, so please go and check that out. Um, what I'm doing, plugs, member, catch Heartless Crew on BBC Radio One Extra every Sunday from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, did, did you catch my takeover really show? It was really good. Oh, yeah. Kelly you can listen to, to it. You can listen back to it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was really good, Kelly. Big up, Thank big you. Up. I loved yes. it. I loved yes. it. Yes. And Spoonie's just whispered in my ear that he is on, did you say Pirate Radio? <laughs> <laughs> 
long time since he's, he's on the BBC but way before us, mate. Remember he, they had us on the yeah, show? Yeah, they had us, yeah. DJs I, always respect the team. They're MCs, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Big up, Spoonie. Radio 2 is... Radio 2, Friday nights. Friday nights. <laughs> yeah, man, come on. Thank you. And I, I, I will put out there... Um, Spoonie did bust us back in the days on a, on a Dream Team show on, on Sunday. That kind of bust the heart crew. We came up there and we done a set and shelled that's it. Right. But that did, that kind of yeah. sent us global still. That's right, that's You right. deserved it. Yeah, man, thank you. Thank you again, Spoonie. Yes, Always. yes, thanks. Um, Got to do a big, massive shout out to Cast Rooms. Um, thank you. Big up the, the guys in the thank room you there. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Cast Rooms as well. Make some noise to Cast Rooms. And. I will just flick through the few pictures that I put up. That's me and Mighty Mo in um, Antigua. Mighty DJ. Mighty DJ. Mighty was actually I a was DJ. I was like, who's that old man? It was Mighty. No, stop that, Kelly. Man. Why are you no, doing that? No, Isn't because he the just... Filter. Why are you being like that? Anyway, no, um, <laughs> this is a photo shoot um, I've done showing off some of the old guys. He garments. just doesn't look like himself. Look, there's but Kelly there. and Elizabeth. <laughs> Uh, and this is me with some UK legends. That's hey. Omar. Absolute. Do you know what? I've got a picture Dada. of Omar. I met him at um, Carnival one year. And then years later, I did a song with him, which is mad. Legend. I was like 16 years old. Legend. Oh, that's a beautiful picture. Another picture one. Of Shola, Omar, another UK legend. Uh, this is an iconic picture. That's when Sp um, Stormzy, I was going to say Spoonie. That's when <laughs> Stormzy <laughs> won his first mobile. Um, so big up Stormzy. He's obviously gone on to do amazing things. Um, this is me and my brothers Harvey and Young Spray when we done, our, uh, we done a tune together back in the days. We looked like a boy band. Um, <laughs> this is oh, the wonderful Egypt, Egypt um, in the morning. Always looking 10 out of 10. Looks like the night time. Um, it looks like an uh, afternoon. Uh, <laughs> in the um, this I know, I is, thought it was dry, Joe. We spoke about uh, Miss Dynamite, <laughs> got to give her a round of applause. Absolute UK legend. Um, this is a very iconic picture. I put this on my oh, yeah. Instagram the other day and it went off. This is Mighty Mo, Giggs, Mr. Jam, Rich 32, Footsie, D Double E, Chipmunk, Kano, and myself. How did Mr. Jam get in there? He was a DJ. He was a DJ. But um, this is later on, and I know it looks like, the, like we could have taken a picture the day after. That is also me and Shola Amar. Um, years later, after the other picture, still looks wonderful. Wearing Egypt's jacket, you are. <laughs> Spoonie, go home. Uh, <laughs> this is me and the Godfather MC Wiley. Um, got to give him his flowers as well. He's done amazing stuff for the team, man. So, we got Wiley. This is me again doing a little bit of modelling. Um, <laughs> we're, we're moving on quickly. Uh, me, Fonty, and D W -E. D W E. They call him like the people's MC. Like definitely one of the goat greatest. They call him the goat. This is me and another goat. R I P M C. Skiddy, Skiddy. Yes, yes, yes. Arguably one of the greatest to do it. Um, me again doing a little bit of modelling. Um, <laughs> this is me and Kano. Big up Kano. Top boy, um, I just put this one in there because he's a hero. John Barnes. John Barnes, yeah. absolute John Barnes. legend. Best rapper in history. <laughs> absolute you legend. You made me think of that. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Right yeah, you know, right. you know, right. you know yeah. we, Me and Spoonie are big Liverpool fans as well, sir. So, yes, and we hold him dearly. Um, this is me and Kelly LaRock. I wow. love this picture. Yeah. Absolutely love that picture. But you can I see how you. much I love you. No, like, I love you more. Yeah. Love, man. Yeah. Absolutely love you more. Are you, still st are you lying down or standing up? I'm leaning Stop on it. him. Oh, well, can't time, stop. the time is kicking. The time is kicking. Um, Calls from the back. Me and Conan again. You know, give everyone the flowers. Carnival. B, 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 you got thousands of pictures, you know. No, we're, we're getting there, man. We're going to be celebrating. That's going to be another show again, Bush. Okay. <laughs> right, well, we're going to wrap up right there because I'm getting fresh. I'm getting all the damage. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Thank you so, so much. Lovely. Big up. Big up the British Library. Big massive Thank shout out to, to the man like Spoonie, Zed Bias, and Kayla Rock, and Bushkin. But Bushkin, you know what? There's one man that you forgot, you know, and he is very pinnacle. He's the man that made me even get into Garage in the first place, and we ain't even showed a picture of him or called his name all day. Who are we talking about? 
man like MC Creed. Oh boy. I'm the one with I the to make it. Oh, did you mention him? Yeah. All right, no problem, no problem. No, no problem. <laughs> All right then, guys, we're going to end it on this one.